Oh, it's a good morning. Sorry, it's a good start. Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the final webinar in our series. I'm just waiting for numbers to creep up a little more. While you're uh, while we're waiting for that, can you just drop in the in the chat box whether you can hear me? Okay. And maybe say hi and where you're from. Okay, so Austria, Germany, Spain, France. Wow, it's going really quickly now. From Ecuador. Wow. Okay, Ecuador the furthest away so far. Mexico, Argentina and Brazil still there as well. Russia. Acapulco, excellent. Guatemala, okay. Fantastic. Well, as I say, welcome to the final webinar in the series of uh, webinars for learners. Uh, today, the webinar is looking at C2 proficiency. Um, so hopefully I'm not going to have, to, I'm not going to speak too slowly uh, today. Um, with me in the Q&A box and on the, and looking on the chat of my colleague, Victoria and a colleague from, from the French office, uh, Camille, uh, hi to them. Thank you very much for joining us and helping out here. Um, just to kick off, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, your microphone and camera have been turned off automatically. We're expecting a large number of people today. Um, so we, it's just not feasible to have people making comments and, and so on. So if you do have a comment uh, during the course of the, the session, use the chat box. Uh, please, when you use the chat box, um, just above where you type, there's a section which says hosts and panelists. Uh, can you set that to everyone so that we can share information as much as possible um, among everybody who's here in the in the session? Um, if you have a question which you want answering or which we can look at at the end of the, the session, um, please use the Q&A box for your questions. So chat for talking to each other, making comments during the during the uh, during the session and the Q and A box for questions which you need answering. Okay, uh, the event's going to be recorded and we'll be sharing the link with you fairly soon after this. So by the end of March, you'll have the recordings of all of the sessions that we've that we've been doing over the last three weeks. And at the end of the session, we'll also share a handout which includes links to various things which I think you might find useful. And finally, we'll be showing you a survey at the end, which would be very grateful if you could fill in to give us feedback on today's session. Okay. So um, moving on, let's have a look at what we're going to look at today. Um, we're going to start off with a quick uh, point about recognition. Um, the recognition of the, the Cambridge exams in general. And then we'll move on to look at C2 proficiency in particular. We'll have a look at the, the different parts of C2, and then we'll take a more detailed look at each part, each paper um, in turn. So we'll start with reading and use of English, then move on to writing, listening, and speaking. At the end, we'll take a look at how we can help, some of the resources which you have available for you, and then we'll move on to any questions. We'll leave a bit of time at the end 
for questions. Uh, we should be finishing at around 7.30. Um, that's Central European time. Okay. So um, just before we launch into C2, C2 itself, let's take a look at recognition because some people have asked us questions about this um, in uh, the questions which we asked you to to register when you when you registered it's awful isn't it that's definitely not c2 don't copy that um so one of the people one of the people asked us if you fail the c2 the c1 exam in this case um but it's same the same thing applies for c2 and get the uh b2 level certificate the count what we call the council of europe certificate do employers and educational institutes uh, institutions consider it as a B2 certificate? The answer is some do and some don't. We unfortunately don't have complete control over who who accepts what certificates for, for any given post. So you really need to check with the people who are recognizing your your information or recognizing your certificate or who you're presenting it to. Uh, the QR code there on the next slide uh, gives you a link to our global recognition page. So you can look up exactly who accepts our certificates um, and match it. So if you're, if you're trying for a job or you're trying for a university, a university place, you can check there whether they accept our certificates and which ones they do. Uh, just a quick overview of, of what we, we mean by this. Um, when you sit a Cambridge exam, the exam is pitched at a certain level. So in this, in this case, our exam is pitched at C2. The example here is pitched at, uh, at B2. Okay, so you see a certificate for B for B two. This is a, what we would see if we had a, a grade C. So first certificate, we have a B two. We have one hundred and sixty on the Cambridge English, and everybody's happy. If you don't read, Sixty, so that means you don't reach the B two level. You reckon fifty nine? Um, we will recognise the B one, and we will send you a certificate. The certificate won't have the name of first certificate in this case, but it will say that you have achieved a Council of Europe level of B one. Some of the are we having problems with sound? Some of the um, recognizing people, uh, some of the recognizing organizations will accept this as a, as a B1 certificate. Some won't. Okay. Um, it's a bit early for this. Is it okay? It could be my internet, yes. Um, we've been having a few problems with it earlier that's so been working fine all day okay um in terms of global recognition um we have across the world recognition of t over 25,000 in fact it's actually over 26,000 recognizing organizations throughout the world um, that is over 13,000 higher and further education institutions, 11,000 employers, and 900 plus governments and ministries from 80 countries. So we do have one of the widest um, recognitions of, of uh, qualifications in the world. Okay. So um, that dealt with, let's have a look at C2 proficiency itself, which is the main the main event. 
I know that most of you know this, um, know the format probably better than I do. Um, but C2 Proficiency now has four papers. It used to have five. Um, paper one, paper one is the component, the, the, the paper is the component. So the exam that you set, the test that you set together. Paper one has reading and use of English. Paper two is actually writing. Paper three is listening. And paper four is speaking. Okay. And there are two ways of taking the, the C2 proficiency. You can take it paper-based or you can take it computer-based. And I see, we, I think we have a problem here. Do we have a problem? Okay. Good. Um, so uh, paper-based is the traditional test which you take on, on a piece of paper, uh, or various pieces of paper, in fact. Um, we also have the possibility of sitting the exam using a computer. That doesn't necessarily mean that the exam is online and you can do it anywhere. The exam has to be done on a computer, but in the same conditions as if you were doing the exam on paper. Okay, so you still have to go to the exam center. You still have to have the invigilators, the, the people who are supervising the exam. You still have the same time. You have exactly the same exam. It's simply delivered. Um, the question, try both with the, the practice tests that we have and decide, your, decide yourself. Obviously, the computer-based has the advantage that you can book an exam closer to the exam day and also you get your results faster. Okay, those those are the advantages, but you, you decide how, where you feel more comfortable. Okay, now um, we have a poll for you, um, which we're gonna launch now. And that's, everybody has their favorite part of the exam but most people have their least favorite part of the exam. So what I'd like you to do is just on the poll, which I think is being launched now, say which of the parts of the exam is the most challenging for you. Okay, just choose one and vote. Okay, it's very, very even as far as I can see. I was expecting usually people, everybody chooses the same one. Yes, that's right, Martha. Um, use of English is the uh, grammar and vocabulary part, if you like, but it's it's used in, in texts. Okay, interesting. The most challenging part, according to this, is writing. Um, poss possibly, I, I would agree with you. Use of English, some people do it really well. Some people don't do it as well. Um, it, de it depends a little bit on your mentality. And the reading, we'll have a look at the challenges of reading a little bit later. But writing definitely has its has its points. Okay, so let's take a look at the timings. So reading and use of English is 90 minutes. That's an hour and a half. Writing is also an hour and a half. Listening is about 40 minutes. And speaking takes 16 minutes. Okay. And there we've just given you some um, example can-do statements from the Common European Framework to show you the sort of things that we're looking at 
So reading and use of English is very much text-based, so they can understand, a person can understand details of complex documents. Writing, a person can write on any subject with good expression and accuracy. Listening can understand in any context, including colloquial language, although we don't tend to use too much colloquial language in our exams. And speaking can talk about complex or specialist topics, negotiate and persuade effectively. Okay, so lots of things that you have to do in speaking. So let's take a look at reading and use of English. As I say, reading and use of English are two, uh, they're the two text-based disciplines, the two text-based components put together. And this means that you have to work very carefully, very, very, with a lot of discipline, I think, in, in, in use of English. Okay. So at C2 level, for reading and use of English, a candidate needs to can demonstrate that they can engage with a range of texts of different lengths and complexity. Most of the texts for the reading part are very long, and it's it's a complicated it's a complicated test. But you need to be able to deal with those texts quickly and efficiently. And that means that you don't have time to read everything. You have to be able to find the information you need and answer the questions quickly and efficiently. Okay, if you stop and read all the text, you will run out of time. Okay, so I'm sorry, uh, David, I'm saying that you need to be able to deal with the texts quickly and efficiently, not reading every word, not worrying about not understanding everything. Okay, uh, we'll take a look at the format now uh, later to see the number of texts. Okay, um, students also need to be able to engage with a range of texts from different sources and different text types. So you may find text from fiction or from non-fiction. Uh, they may be uh, scientific texts not obviously sort of general scientific texts, um, but they may be all sorts of texts and you need to be able to recognize the type of text and deal with it, find the information. You also need to find, you need to deal with different task types and question focuses. We'll see that a little later. And you also have to be able to engage with a wide range of reading and language skills focuses. The language skills focus is obviously for the use of English. So, these are the parts which are associated with the use of English. Part two, part three, and part four. Part two is a gapped text. Um, it's a text with different spaces. Each space corresponds to one word. Underneath the text, you will see uh, is focusing mainly on grammar and uh, some vocabulary. Where it's vocabulary, it is things like phrasal verbs, collocations, and so on. Part three, you're given a text which has eight gaps. Again, each gap corresponds to a word, and you have to, you're given a stem word, a basic word in the margin next to the text. And you have to use that base word to create another word. Again, we'll see this in a minute. Uh, you have to use that text to create another word um, using affixation um, or changes in the word or compounding in order to create a new word. We'll see that in a minute. So. Um, so you'll 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 get you'll understand that rather better. And in part four, you're given a lead-in text, a lead-in sentence, and a gapped sentence, 
which should mean the same as the lead-in sentence. And the gap needs to be completed with between three and eight words. Um, and they must include a keyword which you're given. Okay, again, we'll see that in a moment. For reading, you have four parts. Part one is, again, a text with eight gaps. But for each gap, you have four options underneath the text. And this is focusing particularly on idioms, collocations, set phrases, complements, phrasal verbs, and semantic precision, meaning choosing the right word from similar meaning words. Um, what I should say in proficiency, there is no such thing as a synonym. Every word has uh, a slight difference either in its use or in its meaning, which means that you have to choose between very similar words quite often. In part five, you're given a long text, and that is followed by a number of multiple choice questions. Each question has four options, and that is testing your identification of detail but possibly also understanding an opinion which may or may not be explicitly expressed, or you may need to understand the attitude or the tone which the writer is using. Okay. Part six has text from which paragraphs have been removed, and you have to put the paragraphs back in the right place. There will be a paragraph which you don't need to use. And in part seven, you have either a text or a number of short texts, and there are a number of questions before that, which correspond to one or other of the texts, or one part or another of the single text. Okay. So here are the examples. This is an example of part one. You'll see that there are various gaps and each gap has a list of four words corresponding. Notice the words are all very, possibly all very similar in meaning, but only one works. So for um, maybe just in the chat box, have a look at number one. It has succeeded in something, the imagination of millions, since it first something. Okay, which of the four options for number one is the correct one? Some people here are very quick. And nearly everybody is right. It's B, capturing. And that is a, a simple collocation. To capture the imagination is a word group. It's what we call a collocation, which is regularly um, seen, the words which are regularly seen together. Carrying the imagination, conquering the imagination don't work. Okay? So you would have eight gaps in there, and you would have eight questions. And somebody's just decided to do the rest of the test as well. So 2A, since it first, no, 2B emerged as a genre. Three, what do we put? Uh, three is D and four, is a okay just because some people like to uh, to check these things okay um that's done the next thing that's the the gap but let's move on to part two in part two you it's the same basic exercise but you don't have options underneath and the reason that you don't have options is that the focus is on a different type of word. So here, for example, the, the example text is but, 
um, which is obviously a, a more of a grammar word than a meaning word. And this is testing structure and the use of grammar words much more than it is testing meaning. Um, what you may find is uh, in a phrasal verb, you may find that uh, what you have is uh, the preposition part of the phrasal verb uh, or the or the the article of of the phrasal of the, the phrasal verb. It's not called an article. I can't remember what it's called. But anyway, um, so again, this is looking at much more the structural form and the way the structure works. This is part four, um, which I tried to explain. Here you have a sentence, and then you have a second sentence with a gap. The second sentence has the same meaning as the first sentence, and you need to complete it using between three and eight words, including the word way. And in this case, you can't change the word way. Okay. Particle. Thank you, Jared. What would I do without you? So somebody suggested showed the way. So well, that's the opposite meaning. You have to have the same meaning. Tatiana, I think you're right. We're instructed to make their way down the bus by the driver. Either uh, instructed or told. If I put asked, would that be correct? So passengers were asked to make their way down the bus by the driver. Quite right. Technically, grammatically, it's correct. But because we're using the word instructed, that doesn't have the, the force of a question. He's not asking them, he's telling them. He's giving, giving an order. And that's what we mean by subtle differences. Sometimes the word looks right, it should work, and it does work. It just doesn't convey the full meaning, okay, of the of the of the sentence you're given. In this in this part, you can get either two marks or one mark, or obviously zero. Okay. And the two parts are divided. So passengers were told or were instructed. And then to to make their way would be the other part. Okay. So passengers were told to make their way or passengers were instructed to make their way down the bus by the driver. Okay. Again, have been told you're changing the tense. So mix it down. Again, you're not using the word way. So again, that wouldn't uh, that wouldn't work. Okay. You can find plenty of examples of these on on our website, so you can practice them. This is part of part seven. Okay. Remember, we said that you would have a number of shorter texts and 10 questions before the texts, okay? Um, these are two of the 10 questions and only one of the examples, one, one of the, the, the texts which you would be using. And these probably refer to question A, or uh, text A, okay? The questions are not in any order they correspond to one or other of the texts. You have to find which text the the well, it's not a question, the the sentence is related to. 
Okay, so which text says that to it are unfounded? For example, the texts share uh, a common topic. Okay, so in this case, it's talking about the internet. All right. Again, um, one of the things that we that we look at when we are when we are um, dev uh, devising a test, uh, we sort of decide whether you should read the questions first or whether you should read the text first. In most cases, you'll see that the text comes in the paper before the questions. In part seven, the questions come before the texts. And that would suggest that the best approach for this is to read the questions first and then look at the texts. Uh, because you're really looking for very specific information for each of the questions. If you have the idea in your head of the questions, um, then you'll read the texts just for the information. What you could also do is read one of the texts, then go through all of the questions and see which questions relate to that text, and then go to the next text and go through all the questions again. That's another approach which a lot of people have used. does mean reading the questions quite a lot. So um, to be successful in the reading and use of English paper, um, first of all, you need to be able to distinguish words which seem to have very meanings. For example, sing, pouring, involve movement of liquids but they are used in different situations and have different rifted things. Uh, you need to be very, very precise in your use of these. It seems that there are still problems. Okay, so first of all, you need to be, be clear about distinguishing between very, very similar words. Next, you need to be able to recognize collocations. Collocations, remember words which go together to form set phrases or which are just used habitually together. Third, you need to be able to use the context around the gaps. So if there are a lot of gapped texts in the in the test. You need to be able to look before the text, but also after the text to make sure that you're getting the right answer. And you also need to be not just to distinguish whether you need a noun or a verb or an adverb. Quite often, by the way, in the in the, the 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 word formation, you'll be looking at adverbs being developed from verbs, for example. So the 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 transition, the trans, the the transformation of the word can actually be quite drastic. Um, you also need to know whether the word should be negative or whether the word should be plural, so that it fits into the context uh, when you're putting the the um, the paragraphs back into the text, you need to check the cohesion between the previous paragraph and the following paragraph. Okay. You also need to recognize and produce paraphrase. Um, you'll be asked in the question, you won't see the, the words which come in, the, which actually provide the answer normally. You'll, be, you'll see a paraphrase of it. So you need to be able to recognize how things are said. The same thing is said in different ways. You also need to be able to discriminate between the accurate answers and the distractors. The distractors are the wrong answers that you're given. 
and they are usually quite possible or you might think that, that they're quite possible and there's usually just a very small reason why they can't be right in the same way that we looked at asking instead of instructing or telling okay in the in the previous example we also need to understand how the text fits together you need to understand the coherence of the text apologies for a moment Okay, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, you need to understand how a text is put together and how the links are created. So the sort of cohesive devices used like reference, this, that, pronouns, um, however, introducing the opposite point of view and so on. And also, and this is, really really important from b2 upwards you need to be able to look through a text quickly and find the right answer without worrying about the rest of the text okay so to prepare for reading um take a look at real life texts but not just any text look for quite complex texts you should be able to read quite complex language by this level uh so magazines for example the economist uh the new yorker not sort of more popular magazines but maybe scientific magazines or political magazines even business magazines where the language is going to be more 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 challenging shall we say and look at articles and make sure you get through the article and look at the way the article is put together as well okay you need to work on collocations synonyms one thing i would suggest you is to keep a um a vocabulary notebook and in that vocabulary notebook don't just note down words with their translations note down words and how they are related to other words words which go together so collocations um words which are very similar in meaning so they link together words which are in the same field the same you find them in the same sort of texts for example practice reading in different ways so practice uh, skimming which is looking through the text very quickly for general information for a general idea of the text scanning which again is looking through the text but looking for specific information practice when you're looking at practice test work practice reading the questions first or reading the text first practice reading the title or using any pictures which you have to help you to predict what's going to happen in the text and also always try to find evidence for the answers. Why is your answer right? And also, why are the other answers wrong? Don't just stop at finding the right answer. Look at finding the wrong answer as well and saying why it's wrong and what you would need to change perhaps to make it right. That's a really challenging, but it's a really useful exercise to do. And that's the same in, in reading, it's the same in listening. You can use the, the um, I'm going to use the very old word, tape script, um, to, to find um, the, the right answers and the wrong answers. What changes would you make in the tape script to make the wrong answers right? Okay, a couple of examples of collocations. Um, to 
um, just trying to think of some uh, to look up to is a phrasal verb, but it's also a collocation. The words go together. Um, to make the most of is a way that it's a, a set phrase. The words go together. You might need to put in most in a in a gap. Okay. And also train your precision. Um, do your reading. Okay. I'm going to press on now. Have a look at writing. A lot of you said you didn't like writing. Um, I can see why. The writing task has um, two parts. You have to do two pieces of writing. The first part, you always have to do an essay. And the essay is based on information which you draw from two texts. And those texts are about 100 words each. Okay, so you're doing quite a lot of reading before you start writing. And for that reason, if you notice, the word limit in part one is shorter than the word limit in part two. Okay, then in part two, you're given the choice of three options, but there are four possible text types. Okay, so you can answer an article, a letter, a review, or a report. Okay. You won't have all of them. You'll have three of those four always. This is the rubric, and it's always the same um, for part one. So you, it won't be a surprise to you. What will be a surprise are the texts and the topic. And the, the rubric is simply write an essay, summarizing and evaluating the key points from both texts. Use your own words as far as possible and include your own ideas in the answer okay so the various things that you have to do here first of all you need to read the texts understand the arguments in the texts and you're looking to find probably two main points in each text you may find they agree with each other. You may find that they they contrast. Usually they will they will contrast. But you're looking to draw two main ideas from each text. You then need to transfer that into an essay, which is using your own words. So you're paraphrasing. Okay, you're paraphrasing what you're getting from these texts, using your own words to express the same ideas and adding your own ideas as well. Okay, so quite a complicated, complex um, series of things that you need to do. In part two, as I said before, your task focus, you're given a choice. You have to write one of these. You won't always find all of them in the in the text. So you may find that the question is, uh, between an article, a letter, and a review, and there's no report. Or there's a letter, a report, and review, there's no article. This means that you need to be proficient in at least two of these text types in order to be able to answer comfortably. Okay? Again, this is a, an example of a question. And it's asking for an article. Okay, moving on, um, the writing is assessed using four points, content, organization, communicative achievement, and language. I'm going to focus now on these two very briefly, and we're just going to look at the marking criteria for communicative achievement. So out of three, which is a passing C2 level, Notice that we are using the conventions of the task. So we're writing the right structure of text. Okay. To communicate complex ideas in an effective way. Fulfilling all of the communicative purposes. So the, the, the reader needs to be fully informed. They need to understand everything. Okay. And you need to communicate not just simple ideas, but complex ideas. 
and explaining them and describing them and and um and um yeah okay so um what i'm looking at here is the step up from c1 to c2 okay so in the essay in c1 candidates usually compare and contrast two aspects in their in their essay in c2 they develop the ideas more you've got a little bit more room you've got a little bit more uh, of a word limit you've got the opportunity the opportunity to develop your ideas more and explain your ideas more and the explanation allows you to express more complex ideas okay you should also be giving um, relatively similar weight to each of the ideas. Okay. This is very important. Something which stands out even from C1 is the use of an objective approach rather than giving a personal opinion that I think or in my opinion, you should be expressing ideas in a much more objective way. So it is generally accepted that people often say that it is um, generally agreed that. Okay, or just statement, you know, the um, this is bad because, and then using your arguments, using your the the development of the idea to explain why and give evidence as to why your idea is correct. Okay, rather than just relying on I think that, which can be shot down with I, I don't. Okay, you also have to be much more flexible. Um, a lot of people ask at lower levels, um, how many paragraphs? Here, the flexibility as many as you need. Okay, so you have to be flexible and you which is a spirit approach and you have to show that you know how to write and that you know the format of the essay and you can actually manipulate that format to help you to express your ideas so you're using form to create meaning as far as organization is concerned again it has to be well organized coherent has to use a variety of cohesive devices and you have to be able to use all of these with flexibility. Again, what I was saying before, you have to use what is appropriate for what you're trying to say. Okay. Um, you can't download the scripts, but you will be able to get access to the, to the recording. So you can listen again if you, if you need to. Okay. Preparing for writing. Um, Spend some time planning. Learn how to plan. Learn um, to make a, a part of your practice, part of your writing routine uh, should be to plan ideas and to think about the task. There's no way that you can hold such complex ideas in your head as you write. Um, by reading different types of text, you'll be able to understand the different requirements of different text types okay and practice using functional language and and look at different registers um, read something which is more popular and also read the same piece of news in a more serious newspaper for example okay um make sure that that you understand the assessment criteria you'll find the assessment criteria in our handbooks which we'll give you a link to at the end of the the end of the talk and build critical thinking skills you need Make notes of turns of phrase 
that you love. Um, you know, I really wish I had thoughts of that's a really good way of starting example. Can you hear me? Can you hear now? Okay, I'll carry on. Sorry about this. You'll be able to get the recording anyway, so hopefully you'll be able to hear on the recording. Okay, moving on to listening. Listening is very similar to the, it's the same sort of range of skills. But now you're be, you're dealing with recorded texts rather than reading texts. There will be a range of different types of text, and there will be different lengths of text. Okay? And you'll be listening in different contexts as well. So you'll find sometimes you'll be listening to monologues. Sometimes you'll be listening to two people talking together. Sometimes you'll be listening to something which is called a guided monologue. So somebody asking questions and somebody answering those questions. Okay. And there will be a lot of different types of speaking texts. So interviews, lectures, talks, broadcasts, conversations that you hear on the train or whatever. Um, and not recorded in real life settings. So there, are, there is not background noise. Um, you will be listening to a variety of accents, but you'll always be listening to stand English, okay, of varying types and in different accents, but always standard English. These are the ta the, the uh, task types. So in part one, you'll listen to three shortish recordings, each about a minute long. And after each recording, you'll have two questions with multiple choice answers. Part two, you'll hear a monologue or a prompted monologue. That's where somebody asks questions and then somebody answers them. And that will last about three or four minutes. And then you're given a set of questions, incomplete sentences. So you're completing notes here. Okay. You listen to all of the recordings twice. Okay. In part three, you will hear a recording with interacting speakers, you know, the dialogue, and you then have a series of multiple choice questions, options, not three. This makes it slightly more complicated. Okay. And possibly the final question may well be looking at the whole text or the attitude of one of the speakers, something like that. So it could be a global question at the end. And then part four, this is everybody's favorite. Um, you have four, uh, five monologues, each about 35 seconds long. And then you have to do, the monologues are based on the same topic. And then you have to do two tasks while you're listening. Okay, so do, doing two tasks at the same time. Okay, I will see an example of that in a minute. Okay, so this is an example of part one. So you would listen to a text about a minute long, and then you have to answer two questions about the text. Okay. Part two, you listen to a long text and you have to complete these notes using between one and three words. This could include numbers. It could include all sorts of things. Okay, it could include names. Spelling has to be correct in, in this part. Okay. And in part four, this is the, the one that everybody loves. Um, you have to answer task one and task two about the same speakers in the same listenings. Okay, so you listen twice to the speakers, 
but you have to answer both tasks in those two listings. It's very, very similar to, to the C1 format. Okay. And you notice that we're looking for reason in task one and experience in task two. And the question is about uh, the, the tasks, the text to our students talking about doing an internship. An internship is professional work experience in a company. So you notice you might not know what internship is, but it's actually being explained in the question. Okay. So this is an example. We don't have time to actually listen to this, but you can access this on <laughs> you can access this on our website and you, you can practice listening to the text. So again, to be successful in listening, you need to be able to deal with a variety of accents speeds, you'll find that you'll, the people here are speaking quite quickly and different styles of delivery. Even at this level, I would say that you will always find if you find two people speaking together, uh, and some of these will be dialogues or, or prompted monologues, the, the voices will be noticeably different. Usually you will have one man and one woman speaking where there are three people you will find that they are very um very different voices so you may find that one is american and one is british for example just so there's a, a clear distinction between the speakers just to help you there again you need to recognize paraphrase and functions um, you won't be listening to the same words as you're seeing in the questions. You have to be able to find different words. You need to be able to distinguish, find the main information, find what is less important, um, distinguish between the main line of argument and detail, and be able to follow an argument through quite complex language. And you need to be able to follow connections between ideas. And this is something which is, is probably different in C2 to other levels. You may find that you only identify what is the correct answer when you see evidence for it later. So you need to keep more of the spoken text in your head, in your memory because it might prove to be important later. Okay, so that's called backtracking, to be able to think back to a point which came before, which becomes relevant at a later point. Okay, and you need to stay calm. You're always going to listen twice. So if you miss an answer the first time, you have a second listening to check find that answer particularly for example in this backtracking you might identify that it came before you don't quite remember what it was but you remember where it was and really really important you're always given time to look at the task before you listen take advantage of that and there's always a little bit of time between questions or between uh tasks for you to be able to check your answers look through have that last look and you need to spell correctly preparation is for, again very similar to the preparation for reading in fact even use reading to help your listening use reading to learn the format of different types of speaking look at the uh, tape script um look at what you what you're listening to and follow it you don't it's not cheating it's it's learning use real life listening listen to as much english as possible in as varied a pos uh, varied uh, as forms as possible and don't just focus on listening in video video will give you visual clues 
which you're missing in listening. So listen to audio as well. Listen to fiction, listen to news programs, current affairs, science programs, nature programs, anything that you can. And if you get a chance to listen to real English people speaking or real English speakers speaking, take a, take advantage of it. Again, try to create your own listening tasks. Use the, the script with the listening in the book, for example, if you're following a textbook, and create your own answers, create your own questions. And again, change it around so that different questions or different answers are right. Okay? The more you listen and the more varied you listen, the better. And use prediction. Prediction is a really important tool in all of the all of the parts of the exam, but particularly in listening. Look at titles, look at topics, try to predict the sort of thing that you're going to listen to before it happens. Okay? Try to summarize, try to paraphrase just generally. Okay? Uh, we're moving on to speaking. And speaking has three parts, although part three is sort of divided into two parts. So you could say there's a part four. Part one, it's a very similar format to, to the other Cambridge exams. You have a conversation between the examiner and each candidate. This is usually talking about yourself, giving information about yourself, giving your opinions or at this level speculating about different topics okay so it may not be just about you in part two this is different from the other cambridge exams lower down in that part two is the collaborative task you're given a set of photographs and the examiner will first ask you to look at one or two of the photographs and have a conversation, a reaction to those photographs. And then there is a decision-making task, which is also working together um, based on all of the photographs. Then in part three, each person is given uh, a card with a question and some support. And they have to speak on their own for about two minutes. After they finish, the other person, the partner, has a chance to speak, give their opinion, and then they talk together about the topic. So again, there's quite a complicated structure. After they've both done that, um, the um, there is a, a a more general discussion opened up. Okay, which would be the, the part four and other exams. So what do we have to do? We have to be able to use social language because we're talking about ourselves and also interactional language because we are trying to work with another person. So we're taking turns, we're initiating and responding, and we are generally um, working together and using language to work together through an idea. Okay, you have to exchange ideas, but you also have to express your opinions, but also justify them and also comment on your partner's ideas. You really do need to to work together and make it a, a, a clear conversation. Okay, you need to uh, agree and disagree politely uh, and say why, give your reasons. You need to speculate. Um, you need to predict things. Say, I, I, from the picture, I think I can see that this is uh, the person is probably doing this, or is perhaps going to do this, or has just done something. You need to make suggestions, evaluate ideas, and develop points on a topic, and speak for a period of time. And remember the 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 speaking on your own you're speaking for two minutes not one minute okay this is part two 
initially, remember this is working together, initially the examiner might ask you to look at picture A and C, for example, and ask you to express an opinion. Um, or discuss a, a particular aspect of this. And then you have a minute for that. The examiner will then stop you and ask you to look at all of the pictures and give you another thing to discuss. And then you have to discuss the different options and arrive at or negotiate towards uh, an agreement or an outcome. Okay, uh, Joao, you don't necessarily need to keep the language formal, but you do need to make sure that you're speaking at a C2 level. And that often means using quite formal language and quite complex grammar. Okay, it's really important. And this, as, as an examiner, I was an examiner for proficiency for a number of years. And you are specifically told when you're examining be careful. It will feel as if you are having a chat with a friend in the in the exam. But that doesn't mean that they're using C2 level language. You will find that people commit or make very, very few mistakes at this level. So it feels as if you're just having a talk with somebody, a work colleague, or somebody from your faculty or or whatever. But you really have to analyze the language that they're using and make sure they're really using C2 level language. Otherwise, you can have made no mistakes at all and still not pass the exam because you're not working at the right level. So you really need to push your language. Okay. This is part three. This is what you're given in part three. And this is a question that somebody put in the in the the system when they registered. They said, what scares me the most about C2 is the speaking. How can I improvise a speech about a topic that I may lack the necessary knowledge about? Um, what we are testing always is your ability to speak and your ability to speak at the right level. What we're not testing is your knowledge of something. So if you don't know something, it's perfectly fine to invent it. Um, they're not going to mark you down because you didn't know a scientific term, for example. What they are going to stop you on is whether you, if you're using very simple language. So take a look at the question. You're given this question, what makes people work more effectively? It's quite a general topic. And you can approach it through these questions, through these prompts, or you can use your own ideas. Okay, the important thing is to speak for those two minutes. Okay, but there is always support in all parts of the test. How can you practice? Um, you probably need a, a partner. You need a, a practice partner, a study buddy. They they call them in the States. Somebody who's possibly also preparing the exam or who has a certain level and who can work with you in this. They can time you, they can support you as you as you um, speak about this. It's gonna press on to take a look at how we assess speaking. Um notice here in the same as uh, in advanced Grammar and vocabulary have been separated into two separate criteria. Uh, then we have discourse management, pronunciation, and interactive communication, exactly the same. Okay. Um, just going back to how can I practice, and Marina's just beat me to it. You can actually record yourself and, and listen back and be quite critical with yourself and look at the criteria as you listen. Okay. So these are the marking criteria. Notice a uh, three is uh, corresponding to the C2 level. A one is corresponding to the C1 level. And a five is actually slightly above C2, 
The only thing is there isn't a level on the common European framework which is above C2. So C2 is the highest you can get. But those last, that band five is actually technically beyond what is expected at C2. We're going to take a look now at um, what can be done in discourse management. Okay. So we're expecting candidates to produce extended stretches of language with ease. Um, these means that they're not looking for ideas, they're not looking for which definitely. So there's very little hesitation. Um, they have a degree of flexibility. They're using different structures, different patterns, and they're linking their ideas together um, to make them a more coherent. to give more force, more strength to whatever argument to help them do that. Okay. Um, sorry, I jumped onto relevance and coherence. Uh, their contributions are clear and relevant. They start possibly in a slightly conversational way, even not particularly formal, and they can use fillers and resources. One way that you can start is to have a sort of set phrase at the beginning, which allows you, gives you time to, to speak. We lost the sound again. Hello? Can you hear me? Okay, right. So um, we're also going to have a quick look at interactive communication how they work together. Okay, and here, it's very important that it, that when the two people work together, it flows like a real conversation. And so they interact with ease, they, it sounds natural. And when you speak naturally, you automatically link your contributions to what your partner's saying because you're using agreeing or disagreeing with your partner to introduce your own ideas or to comment on your partner and extend what your partner has said add another idea add another example um, modify moderate what he's saying it's partly true but there's also this which we need to consider okay and answering the, the questions Okay, and you need to extend. So when your partner says something, you respond to them, but you add something else, okay? You don't just say, yes, I agree. Now I'm going to talk about something else, okay? Uh, I'm not going to show you the video because we don't have time, but I will show you later how we do this. How do we, how are we successful in the speaking paper? You need to develop what your partner says. You need to expand your answers and you need to show a wide range of grammar and vocabulary. You need to be able to speak for two minutes. It's ideal if every time your time is up, the examiner stops you. Okay, it's really, it's not a problem. The examiner stopping you means that you've covered your time. Okay. And your topic can be quite abstract and unfamiliar, but you should at this level have the maturity to express ideas about abstract things. Okay. Um, your interaction should feel natural and you need to listen. You need to respond. You need to maybe nod when your partner is speaking give the, the back channel um, feedback so that, mm-hmm, right, that sort of thing. You need to be able to speculate to show different um, ideas about what might be happening, not, not just stating the obvious. And you need to be able to discuss messages 
I would also add, you need to be able to make your pronunciation work for you, ideally. So, for example, there are words which we routinely use, like, for example, really, which you can say in many different ways, and it means different things depending on the pronunciation and the intonation that you give to it. So it's not the same to say, really? as to say, really? They're very different meanings. One expressing surprise, but the first one expressing skepticism, shall we say. Preparation tips. Always expand your answer. Always answer why. Always give reasons. Use tactics to express difficulties. There are fillers like, let me think, that's a good question, and so on. But you must be able to express opinions and so on. Listen to your partner and respond to their views. Use the photo to provide context. You're not describing at this level. You're using it as a jumping off point. Use different structures. Um, just basically find a, a number of expressions. Again, you can find them in, in preparation material and broaden the interaction. Try to extend what your partner says always. Bring your experience, your knowledge into the task. Just to wrap up, and I'm aware of, of um, that we're running out of time here, um, how can we help? You can find examples of uh, speaking videos on Cambridge English TV. We'll mention this again in the end. You can also find it on our webpage, so I'm not going to worry too much about this. You also find lots of other useful videos on Cambridge English TV. Somebody asked, are there any self-study book recommendations to improve grammar at C2 level? So here we have the, the Grammar in Use series. You also have phrasal verbs in use, you have vocabulary in use, but look out for the advanced version, which isn't written by Raymond Murphy, it's written by Martin Hewings. Again, you have a, a QR code to get there. You'll find links to these also on the handout. What daily short activity can help me to prepare for the C2 proficiency? Go to our website and to the Learning English tab. And there you can filter by level. Here I filtered by proficient user. You can filter by skill. And you can filter by the time you've got. And it will provide you with a number of activities that you can use to practice in your spare time. And these are designed for independent users. You don't need a teacher to correct these. Finally, um, we have a blog called The World of Better Learning. Again, lots of useful posts, really useful reading material as well at this level. And finally, we have the Handbook for Teachers. We have information about speaking tests, and we have actual examples of speaking tests with the examiner comments. Okay, and you can access all of those from the handout or from here. <laughs> and we'll finish there and just to take a look at the um, Q&A if there are any questions left in the Q&A okay a question on writing from Freda Swinda um, you mentioned that on that an essay it has to be objective can you give examples of ways one can express their thoughts in an objective way? Um, one of the best, oh, by the way, you've got the uh, satisfaction survey has just come up. Um, okay, how can you be objective? Passive voice is one of the most easy, one of the easiest ways of keeping your language objective. Um, you can use... Um, just generalizations 
Um, I think I gave you a couple of examples when we were talking about writing. Um, but generalizations, like, you know, it's generally accepted that um, many people say that and, and so on, just as a way of introducing an argument with more force. Okay. And I think that's the only question which is in the Q&A. Uh, okay, so somebody says, which resource would you recommend to practice in a way that is as close to the real exam as possible? It is quite hard to find mock exams. There are practice exams in the handbook on our website. Um, you can also access the... Um, the recordings for the listening test so you can practice the listening test as well um, I understand that they're not very many obviously there are some very good practice books are, um, available um, but really I wouldn't worry too much about practicing the exam itself too much the important thing is working at the level that we have um, um, one thing I, would, I didn't mention when I was talking about writing Write and Improve is a really important resource, and that can help you to check that you're writing at a C2 level um, and that you're covering all of the points that you need to. Um, that's a really useful resource. Uh, somebody here asking, should we use hedging when writing the C2 essay? I would say, yes, yeah, it's a, it's a normal practice in English writing. Um, hedging is not saying yes or no directly, but you know it seems that, and and so on. It's it just softens those very direct. This is black. This is white. Um, and it's it's a very typical tech used both in speaking and in writing particularly in for more formal settings. So it will be perfectly, perfectly good for C2. Um, question, will CP, will proficiency be updated sooner or later? I'm sure it will. I haven't heard of plans for updating it yet. And that is, it is now 11 years old. It's been 11 years since we made the change. But we have to remember that C2 was the first level which was changed. We've now worked through all of the other exams and change them to bring them in with some of the changes which were introduced. Um, is personal experience considered as objective when writing? It depends how you phrase it. And what I would suggest is that you make a general introduction and then you use personal experience to support that general statement. So your topic sentence would be something like, um, many people find it difficult to do this. And then as a support example for that, you say, in my own experience, I have often found it difficult to do this because whatever. I wouldn't use it in the explaining in giving evidence. Any advice for autonomous learners who are preparing for C2? You are very brave, um, I would say. Congratulations for that. And I would suggest just much listen as much um, to as much. So take advantage of that. Find complex texts. Find shall we say, highbrow, serious newspaper articles, find more difficult magazine articles, long, complex um, articles about difficult subjects and read them, make notes about the language which is being used, um, not just particular vocabulary, but also structure words, ways of structuring paragraphs, um, ideas for holding things together. Okay. Uh, do you recommend taking a C2 course? I would recommend taking a C2 course. It's very difficult to know 
that you are pushing yourself up to the right level. You sometimes need somebody there to help you define when you're reaching the level. Um, is in the platinum exam centers and the normal ones, um, I have to say centers is as good as you can get. Um, platinum centers tend to be bigger, um, and therefore they tend to be able to run more exam sessions so you get a, a better um, number of dates but 100 percent it's little difference as a user between a platinum center and an normal one that, that would be the the difference i would say that okay well, um, we don't seem to have any more questions. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining. Um, thank you for bearing with me. It is extremely difficult to talk you through four papers at this level um, in an hour and a bit. So apologies that I didn't go into perhaps as much detail as you would have liked on certain parts. Um, I hope you've got a general idea. And again, if you missed something, um, take a look at the recording. Also, apologies for the sound. My my computer has been working perfectly all day. It was connecting to this uh, session and it started messing about. So thank you very much. Thank you also for Victoria and Camille, who have been working very hard behind the scenes. And um, yeah. Uh, good luck with your C2. I hope you do really well. I'm sure you will. And I hope that this has been at least a little bit useful.